Hi, my name is Sam Pardew and I'm the CEO and founder of Endo. The whole Endo story started because I live in a 1906 Portland Craftsman house with beautiful old original divided light windows. I wanted to do something to improve the comfort and energy efficiency, but I didn't want to rip them out. Endo was my solution. We're really happy to be involved with the historic preservation community and to welcome you to the Window Hero webinar series. This time we're pleased to be joined by Gordon Bach, co-author of The Vintage House, a guide to successful renovations and additions. Gordon is an expert on older historic homes. We're honored to have him here today to talk about ways to approach changing a vintage house without damaging its character. Gordon is a writer, editor, architectural historian, and technical consultants specializing in residential architecture, historic building construction, and early modern design of the arts and crafts movement. Best known for his two decades of work on Old House Journal, Gordon is a national authority on all aspects of historic houses. He's a contributing editor at traditional building and period home magazines, and also writes and edits a wide variety of other publications including Arts and Crafts Homes and American Bungalow. A frequent lecturer and public speaker, Gordon is an instructor for the National Preservation Institute and taught at the former Historic Preservation Program at Drew University in Madison, New Jersey. Gordon can walk the talk when it comes to renovating renovations, having restored an 1880s Queen Anne house in Silver Spring, Maryland, and he's currently working on an 1880s family homestead and rural Pennsylvania. You can reach Gordon through his website www.gordonbach.com. Without further ado, I will turn it over to Gordon. Thank you, Sam and Christina. It's a pleasure to be with you all this afternoon and talk about my favorite subject, vintage houses. My co-author Mark Hewitt and I have both been immersed in the subject for about 30 years. And over that time, we kept hearing some of the same questions. Not a few of them, by the way, about windows. So we decided to answer them in the form of a book. What I thought I'd do this afternoon is take you all on a little journey through a few of the ideas in our book that we're trying to share. We call our book The Vintage House because we see a conscious parallel to vintage wine and connoisseurship. You know, it's an old saying that you never really own an old house. You're just the steward of it for a while while you pass it on to somebody else. And this is part of what's behind this idea. There are many reasons why somebody might be attracted to a vintage house. Age value is one. The fact that a house may be 60, 100, 120, 200 years old. Historical value is another. Maybe the house is the first one in town, or built in a unique style, or by a famous architect. Maybe George Washington slept there. Property value is not to be overlooked. While this is not the focus of our book, there's no denying that houses are major assets for anyone, and you want to maintain that value by treating the building right. Nostalgia can be a driver. Maybe the house is a connection to the past, or the memory of grandparents. However, for most folks, a vintage house is not embalmed architecture stuck in the past. It's very much alive and speaks to their lifestyle and view of the world. And vintage houses are not all about the past. This idea of embodied energy, which we'll look at later, is a very here and now concept tied into sustainability and green building. In our view, all of this adds up to connoisseurship. Speaking of connoisseurs, the vintage house connoisseur par excellence in this country, according to us, is a fellow named Richard Genret. He calls himself a collector and he has something like a dozen landmark buildings around the country that he's restored with his own funds. Of course, as a successful investor and businessman, Genret has the means to exercise his passion. But be it, we admire his dedication to setting a standard for what an individual can do to restore and maintain a vintage house. Someday, I hope to meet Genret, and when I do, I might ask him to adopt me. But till then, I'll be more in this camp. This is the old New Yorker cartoon. Our dream is to live long enough to see the end of our renovation. While this is probably a bit of an exaggeration, 
There's no question that to live in and work on an old house takes about four years for the average project. And it takes a lot of effort, too, but the results are worth it. It also becomes sort of a lifestyle. As the other caption says, surviving a renovation after catching the fever. You kind of get all wrapped up in it. Another person we look up to and admire is a fellow by the name of Stuart Brand. You may remember the name from the Whole Earth Catalog in the 1960s. About 15 years ago, Brand wrote a book called How Buildings Learn, and this notion that a building could be organic and thought of as an organism is a very interesting and useful idea. This drawing that's on the left here is from Brand's book, and even though we don't need to look at all the callouts, the big line in the middle of structure is part of what he's driving at. If we think of a house as not just a, as a box, but as something with bones, such as the framing that holds it up, and then especially this other, other call out here, the skin on the outside, being the paint, the siding, and the roofs and the windows, we can start to make an analogy to an organism. Certainly the bones are always going to be there holding the building up, but maybe the skin or the feathers or the outside shell molts from time to time as the building grows and changes and adapts to its environment. This idea of a holistic view, an organic view of the building, is what can give you better results when you have to make changes. Anyway, getting back to the notion of questions, the number one question we keep hearing is, where do I start? We've had folks come up to us and say, we just bought an old house, we love it, and we can't wait to get to work on it. There's some changes we want to make, or maybe it needs help. Where do we start? Well, it's hard to get your head around, but I often tell folks you should start by literally doing nothing. This draws a blank expression from time to time, but here's why we say it. Sit back and try to understand what you have first before you make any changes. Look at specifically how the house was built, its construction. If the building is several deca decades old, it probably has a couple additions, and they may not all be in great condition or built the same way. You should also understand the concept of the house. A house of any age is probably not the same today as the day it came off the drafting board. Perhaps it was designed by an architect, or maybe it's a farmhouse built by the farmer. Understand that first, and then get a sense of what has happened to it in the intervening years. This idea may be very foreign to you, but it's not my idea. The folks in the gardening industry, especially historic gardens, take the same approach. You acquire a house, you've got a garden, suppose you want to plant tulips. Well, sit back and look at the garden through several seasons. You may find, come springtime, that you already have tulips, and not only plenty of tulips, but more colors than you would ever imagine. Well, you're not going to know that if you go out digging up the garden now, planting bulbs. So sit back and look at your building for a while. When we talk about concept, let's get into a couple of words here. And you don't have to be an architectural historian to grasp these. We think of houses as having two ideas behind them, the form, or typology, and the style. On the left here, the house form, these are the basic geometric shapes that most houses in North America are built around. And this is not all of them, but they're pretty simple. We have the front gabled one-story building up here on the left, salt box in the center, I think we've all seen that, four square in the middle on the right, with the equilateral sides and the pyramidal roof. I house down on the bottom is simply one room deep and two rooms high. Down in the south hit, southwest here, we have a lot of courtyard or patio houses from the Spanish influence. These are the basic shapes that have been going on for almost 400 years on this continent. Now, if we think of these as the human body, what goes on them is really the style, almost the clothing or costume. House styles, such as on the right, vary from time to time. They're very fashion conscious, a lot like ties that change width or hemlines that go up and down. 
The point is that you can have the same house form in different styles, and especially over a period of time. Sometimes the same house can be cast in different styles. Here's an example. This house on the left is a mansion built by the Estelle family down in New Jersey in the 1830s. It's sort of a Georgian house. Five bays wide, chimney on either end, a rich man's house at the time. But by the 1920s, the de descendants decided the house was getting dowdy, so they decided to, do it, to colonial revivalize it. And what did they do? They not only expanded the house, they added columns across the front, a pediment, more space in the back. The same house has a different appearance over the course of a century. Everything goes pretty good, or at least in a straight line, when maybe you've got the same hands working on it. But suppose you've got a variety of cooks in the kitchen. You might wind up with something like this. This little bungalow looks like it's gone through several ownerships. I love these more style windows in the front here, but they're kind of a 90 degree turn from the other windows in the back. Certainly the building has a low pitch roof in the front, except when you get up on the roof and there's a shed dormer sort of colliding into it, yet another dormer. You know, I think the right hand didn't know what, was ha what the left hand was doing here. And sometimes that's what happens with houses. And it's not a high hanging crime, but for most old house folks, the idea is we want to make changes that look like they fit the building. Does this fit the building? I don't know. Along the same lines, one of my pet peeves is roofs. You know, you go to a strip mall and you don't even see the roof. You go downtown, you look at the beautiful skyscrapers and you don't see the roof. But houses, you see the roof. In fact, roof, roofs make up about 40% of what you see on a house. And they are not only important visual aspects, they define what the house is. They help shape the plan of the building as well as a lot of the other aesthetics. My point is, if you start tampering with the roof, you're going to make a lot of changes that may produce collateral damage, so to speak. Now, a lot of people look to the roof as a place to expand or alter a building, and it can be done with the talents of a good architect. But if you don't watch what you're doing, I say you get out on thin ice. Here's an example. I'm not saying this is a bad thing, but, it does, but does this addition on top clearly fit the building or look like it's always been there? I would say, eh, not really. Dormers are another pet peeve. I call this dormer do's and don'ts. When a dormer is the same footprint as the building, and almost the same volume, is it a dormer anymore? Well, I don't know. And then let's come to windows. My good friend and colleague Jim Massey lent me this photo, and boy does it make a point. Any nine-year-old can see that something's missing here, and, w and is what, what is missing is the windows. This makes a point about what the impact of windows can be on a building. Like the old line, you don't miss your water until your well runs dry, we can see how dramatically this building has been altered, not only by changing the windows, but by eliminating them to totally. This may not be as rare a case as we might think it is. So why do we care about historic windows? Well, there are many reasons. To start at the beginning, windows are literally the eyes of a building, and this is where the word window comes from. And some would argue that windows are even the source of architecture itself. The idea of trying to get openings in a wall without having the building fall down so you can get light in has been the driving force of architecture for millennia. For us, windows are typically the most dominant parts of an otherwise plain building. If you don't have too much else going on in the building, you probably have a door and then windows. And if you take the windows away, as we just saw, we just have a box. In terms of historic buildings, suppose we have a landmark building. Windows can be what we call important character-defining features and worthy of preservation by virtue of their design, craftsmanship, and historic significance. And again to the here and now, we see more and more that retaining and rehabilitating windows is also increasingly recognized as a sustainable building practice. We're recycling them along with the embodied energy in other parts of the building as a whole. 
Not to belabor the point, but look at this building. This is a mill up in Massachusetts. It's so big I had trouble fitting it into the photograph. You can imagine, though, if we took the windows out of this building, and there are hundreds and hundreds of them, we would have no building, no architecture. We would just have a great big brick block. So windows are important, and they get changed. And should you think that what I call the window change game is something of our lifetimes in the TV era, think again. These drawings are from a book from the 1850s by an architect named George Woodward, and boy doesn't this look familiar. On the left here we have the old farmhouse, and then, the old, and then when old George gets his hands on it, he's going to improve the building, remodel it literally, into this beautiful state-of-the-art building for the 1850s. Now, we're not reading the copy here, just seeing the effects of his handiwork. But he's not only expanded the building and added more roofs, he's changed the windows. And he's very proud of it. He's made it them bigger, more modern, and this has been the driving force for what I call the window change game for about 150 years. Another way to look at this, and I guarantee you, is that most houses seldom have all their original windows. It's been going on a long, long time. By the time we're finished talking today, you'll realize that this house, which was probably built in the 1700s or so up in Litchfield, Connecticut, does not have its original windows. Even though this is a medieval-style building, the windows are clearly from the mid-19th century, as we'll see shortly. So going back to this idea that you should look at your building, I propose to you that one of the first things you should do is make a window survey. Get a pencil and paper, get a clipboard, get a buddy, and come up with a system. You don't need an app for this. You can do whatever you want. Just go around the building and look at all your windows. Note them down. First count them. You'll probably have at least 38 windows, sometimes into the 50s in a large house. And they'll be all different sizes, even in a small house. And there'll probably be different designs as well. And on top of this, I guarantee you, they will be in different states of condition. Some of them will be almost perfect, even if the building is 100 years old. Some of them will need a lot of, the wor a lot of work. And a lot of them will be in the middle range. Houses do not age or weather at the same rate all over, as we know any time we get around to painting the exterior. So make a window survey. Come up with a system north, south, east, west, number your windows, and you'll be surprised at what you have. Now to help you do this, let's go through a little window speak. There's basically two kinds of windows in the United States and in North America. The kind that came over from Europe is what we call the casement window, and these are sometimes called French windows, and they open like a door. They're hinged on the side. The more popular ones that basically came into their own in this continent and are in almost every building are what are called double hung sash windows. Here the moving parts go up and down vertically, kind of like a guillotine, rather than opening horizontally. A little more nomenclature here. The double hung sash, which is what we're looking at on the left, the parts that moved are called the sash, the frame is actually the part the sashes move in. And this is the box that we don't see here that's in the building. The rails are at the top and bottom horizontal parts of the, each sash. I remember this by thinking of trains and railroad tracks. The styles are the vertical parts of the sash. The muttons, also called the glazing par bars, are these thin sticks in the middle that make up the grid that holds the glass. The meeting rails are at the bottom of the top sash and the bo top of the bottom sash, and they come together to make this sort of horizon or median in the middle of the window. You may have never noticed it before, but all these parts have a molded edge or profile that is also called sticking. In older houses, sometimes this profile actually matches the profile that's on the doors and other parts of the interior architecture, such as moldings. Lights are the $20 term for the glass, or panes. Lugs I put in here because we happen to have a good example on this drawing. These are these things that look like earlobes at the bottom of the styles on the top sash. They help strengthen the connections of the woodwork. You don't see them on every window, 
but they were very popular in the late 19th century. And this last part here, 6 slash 1, 2 slash 2, and so on, this is the shorthand we use to describe windows. And it goes like this. In our drawing here, we have a 4 over 4 double hung sash window. So we would write that 4 slash 4. 6 one slash 1 here would mean a 6 pane over single pane double hung window. 2 slash 2 is 2 panes over 2 panes. You get the idea. Now fasten your seat belts. In our remaining time, I'm going to take you all on a little rocket tour of window history to help you understand what you're looking at in your house. Because, as I say, you're probably going to have windows of different ages, especially if you have a house that's more than a couple generations old. Now, we really don't know what the first windows in this continent looked like. However, they probably came over from England and the continent, and they were probably casement windows. The folks who first settled North America brought with them the skills that they learned in their mother countries, and they built buildings the way that they learned how to build them back home. As I say, they were probably casement windows. There's very little physical evidence for us to work with, but we do, what we do have goes like this. Not far from Jamestown, Virginia, we have an iron casement window frame shown here on the left, and in Massachusetts we have some made of oak. These are casements, again, like, that open like doors. But what's most interesting for us today is the glass that's in them. Glass was actually a precious material. You couldn't get it in big pieces, and it was very expensive. And Plus, there was no way to get it in this continent for the first generations of settlers. It had to be imported. So the glass we see here is small diamond panes called quarrels and they're held in the, the casement sashes by a matrix of lead bars called a lattice. So these are often called lattice windows or diamond pane windows. And from here windows evolved. After a generation or so, house builders realized that this is a different place here, this North America. The windows are much, much colder, the summers are much, much hotter, and we have much more wood than anybody in Europe and in other countries ever had for millennia. So they started to change the way they built buildings, and especially windows. The driving force in windows through most of the history of windows in this country is to get more glass in, to make the windows bigger, and have less obscuring mechanisms to impair the view out. So, as we can see, we start with small casement windows on the left, and then we add more panes to get more glass in, and yet we have to support them with all these bars, and then we get a little bit bigger glass, and then fewer bars, and then on and on and on. Muttons, too, that is the glazing bars that hold the glass in place, changed along with the evolution of windows. Very quickly, here on the left, we have 18th century glazing bars that are rather fat, and yet relatively thin. They had to hold up all these small panes of glass, and the windows themselves were not very thick. Over 200 years, though, the muttons got narrower and narrower and narrower, so they would be less in view when you looked out the window. This is what a 12 over 12 window looks like in a real building. This is a Georgian style mansion that is still in great shape over in Philadelphia. Look at the window that's up there in the middle over the front door. You can see the influence and the presence of these large fat muttons holding up all these panes of glass. Again this is a famous 18th century building built in the Georgian style just before our revolution. After our revolution, though, you know, it was goodbye England. We don't want anything to do with England anymore. So we started looking for a new national model for houses. And yet we turned to Greece, which had just won its independence from the Ottoman Empire. And over above the affinity we had with the Grecian people, the temple buildings there, which were originally built in stone, happened to be a nice model for the buildings we decided to build in this country. They were easy to reinterpret in wood, which we had plenty of, and they worked for public buildings as well as houses alike, and we got what we called the Greek Revival style. This became the national style and the pinnacle of architecture for about 20 years in the early 19th century. On top of the cultural affinity, though, Greek Revival became the new, new thing. That is, it was the modern style, and for a modern building, you also had to have modern windows. 
And so what we call the 6 over 6 window here down in the bottom right hand corner of our drawing really became the archetypal window for the Greek Revival movement as well as through most of the 19th century. Not only that, this is when we first start to see weights and pulleys come in in a wide scale. So these were totally up to date windows. By the 1860s, glass was getting bigger, and at least in terms of affordable glass. If you had no limit on budget, you could get a large piece of glass, essentially an unsilvered mirror, but very few people did. The average person could only afford things like a 12 inch by 24 inch pane of glass. But at any rate, our archetypal window was the 2 over 2 in the 1860s and 1870s, as we see down here on the left. And if you think back, the 1870s, we had railroads running all over the country. We were going to co from coast to coast pretty much with anything, and you could buy pretty much whatever you wanted in terms of a window out of a catalog. Just pick one from column A, one from column B. Column B. You could get the new modern style, four lights to a window down here on the left, or you could still get the 6 over 6, and you could even get 12 over 12s if you really wanted them. You could pick your glass, too. Good glass, second quality glass, whatever you wanted to afford, as well as pick your mutton style. And then by the 1880s, a funny thing happened. Just about the time the Industrial Revolution was really cooking, you could buy a pa and you could buy a pane of glass big enough to fa fit an entire sash, and anybody could afford it, pretty much. All of a sudden, windows take a 180 degree turn we see the reappearance of tiny panes of glass again. It was actually a fashion. You didn't need it mechanically. And when you think about it, this is not so crazy an idea. In 1876, we're 100 years old as a country, and we had a centennial. So designers started to look back at the first buildings built in the colonial era, and they enjoyed picking ideas from these early buildings and then incorporating them into what were then the modern buildings of the era. And that brings us up to the Victorian era. Right here we see the iconic images of the time. The Queen Anne house on the right and the Queen Anne window on the left. Everybody's seen these, especially if you're an old house devotee. These upper sash with tiny little lights in them, often different colors, sometimes surrounding a big piece of glass, and then a single pane in the bottom in the lower sash. This is the Queen Anne window. The colonial revival movement, which was just starting to get in gear also at this time, also made use of this idea. As we can see here in the upper right hand corner of this catalog cut, here we get sort of a lattice pattern, almost a coral looking type of diamond glass, but not as small though. Heck, we, we don't want to go all the way back to the medieval era, but something that's sort of evocative of it. At the same time, well, let's have our decorative window in the top but we'll stick with a big pane of glass in the bottom to show we're modern. This kind of pattern we see for almost 40 years from the 1880s into the 1920s. By 1900 the bungalow was the new new house of the early 20th century and yet had one foot in the medieval era for design ideas. So why not have lattice pattern, pattern windows in the top as we see here and a single pane of glass in the bottom. And in case you want a lot of window, we'll just take the windows and stack them up in twos and threes together as we see here on the right. And despite what I say that you could order windows by catalog from a central factory and get them anywhere in the country, and certainly Sears was selling windows around the country coming right out of Chicago, there were still many, many local variations and local window manufacturers serving a local market. This is a building in North Carolina with a beautiful window pattern up there in those transoms. You see it all over town, but I've never seen it anywhere else. Just a local designer and a local manufacturer serving a local market. Really neat stuff. On and on up to the 1950s, patterns swing back and forth with fashion. Hemlines go up and down. Ties get wider and thinner. When we get up to the 1950s, the poster child house of the of modern suburban developments appears, the ranch house. And again we become infatuated with glass and so we wind up with what else? The picture window. A big pane of glass in the middle of the house. In case you didn't get my point earlier, 
Imagine what this house would look like without any windows. It would have almost no architecture to it at all. So windows are a really important part of houses and glass is a driving factor behind windows. Before we wind up, let's go back to this idea of embodied energy. This is a phrase that's been floating around for, since about 2000. And the idea is, if you're going to make building products, that is glass, bricks maybe, make things out of wood where you have to drag them in from the forest and then saw them up, it all takes energy. And since the 1990s, scientists have actually been putting the pencil to determine how much energy it takes to make all these building products. So if you total this up, we have, uh, we have a list for comic building products on the side here, and we have a tally of embodied energy that might go into a building, a house, a skyscraper, whatever. Now, we, if we were to knock down that building and send it all to a landfill, we're basically throwing away all this embodied energy. That would be bad enough, except that if we're going to build another building, then we're going to go out and cook all the bricks again and drag all the materials out of a quarry or a forest, or ship them from around the world. So the idea of saving our existing buildings and rehabilitating them is an energy conservation effort and is actually recycling the buildings and this gets in, goes for not only for the whole building, building but also for the various parts such as windows. I think you get my point. And there's good and bad ways to do this. We won't get into the good ways so much today. We don't have time. But I borrowed this slide from a good friend and colleague of mine, Steve Jordan, who lives up in Rochester, New York, where it gets pretty cold. And now I propose to you that this is not a good way to upgrade your windows. That is, to just close your eyes and go wild with a spray can. Well, anyway, I'm going to stop here and just close by saying that historic buildings and their components are adaptable, if we think of them as organisms. And they're also renewable and they can be a valuable resource for our culture and our planet. Thank you all so much. It's been wonderful talking to you here.